there's still people coming, but we will start commencer doucement, como, <laughs> how we say in French. Uh, so, uh, you, okay, you already started recording. Florian, you can start, please. Bonjour à toutes et tous, euh, nous vous remercions de votre présence. Avant de commencer, nous voudrions partager avec vous quelques informations concernant la manière d'interagir durant le webinaire. Premièrement, aujourd'hui, nous parlerons en anglais. Si vous n'êtes pas à l'aise avec cela, il n'y a pas de problème, nous déposerons l'enregistrement du webinaire sur YouTube. Deuxièmement, nous vous proposons d'écouter les interventions jusqu'à leur fin et ensuite vous dis disposerez d'un temps de questions et réponses. Si vous désirez poser une question ou faire une remarque, s'il vous plaît, écrivez votre nom dans le chat. Nous vous contacterons à la fin des interventions et vous pourrez allumer votre micro et votre webcam afin d'interagir. Nous essayerons de vous aider avec la traduction du mieux que nous pouvons. S'il vous est possible de parler en anglais, cela nous sera d'une du grand, grande aide. En tant qu'étudiant en muséologie, nous nous sommes présentés bénévolement et nous ne sommes pas des professionnels de la traduction. Nous sommes sûrs que vous comprendrez si nous commettons quelques erreurs. Lors du webinaire précédent, nous avons rencontré quelques problèmes concernant l'utilisation du chat. Si vous ne pouvez pas utiliser le chat, n'hésitez pas à lever la main si vous souhaitez poser une question après les interventions. Vous pouvez le faire en utilisant le bouton Team ou en ouvrant votre caméra et votre microphone durant le temps dédié aux échanges et aux questions. Nous vous rappelons également de bien vouloir désactiver votre microphone durant, pendant les interventions. Si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas à nous écrire à l'adresse suivante babbletowerwebinars.gmail.com. Nous serons attentifs aux emails envoyés durant le webinaire au cas où vous rencontreriez un problème technique de dernière minute et mettrons tout en œuvre afin de répondre à votre demande. La plateforme Team est un outil que nous utilisons en raison des circonstances actuelles, mais nous ne gérons pas cet outil de manière professionnelle. Enfin, nous allons enregistrer ce webinaire afin de le stocker sur YouTube. S'il vous plaît, si vous n'êtes pas à l'aise avec l'enregistrement, vous avez le choix de regarder ce webinaire avec des sous-titres à partir de fin avril sur YouTube. Si vous utilisez votre caméra, soyez attentif à ce qui apparaîtra à l'écran. Si vous avez des questions sur l'organisation ou un problème technique, n'hésitez pas à nous contacter via le chat ou par le mail Babble Tower. Nous vous remercions pour votre attention et nous vous souhaitons un bon webinaire. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Before starting, we would like to share with you some information on who to interact during the webinars. First, today, we will talk in English. If you don't feel comfortable with that, don't worry. We will upload the registration on the, of the webinar on YouTube. Second, you will hear the interventions at, and at the end, there will be time for questions and answers. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, please write your name in the chat. We'll call you at the end of the interventions and you will be able to open your microphone and the webcam in order to interact. We'll try to help you with the translation at the best, but if you can speak English, that will be help us a lot. As students in museology, we are volunteers and we are not professional translators. We are sure you will understand if we make some mistakes. We have detected detected some problems with the use of the chat. Please, if you cannot use the chat, feel free to raise your hands if you want to ask a question after the intervention. You can hit use an, using Teams button or opening your camera and microphone during the Q&A time. If you have any question, please do not hesitate to write us an email to babbletorewebinars at gmail.com. We will check it also during the webinar in order to try to assist if you have any last moment technological issue. Teams, Teams technology is a means that we are using due to the current circumstances. We do not manage this tool professionally, but we are trying to do our best for making this a nice experience for all of us. Third, we kindly remind you to silence your microphone during the interventions. 
Finally, we are going to record this webinar in order to store it on YouTube. Please, if you don't feel comfortable, you have the option to watch the webinar by YouTube with subtitles by the end of April. If you use the webcam, please be conscious of what will appear on the screen. If you have any question about the organization or a technical problem, don't hesitate to contact us via chat or the Bubble Tour email. Thank you. Enjoy it. Thank you, Florian. Um, I'll start. And so thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, we are now at the fifth event of uh, our webinar series. Many of you have already joined us during the previous webinars, but for those of you who are here for the first time, let me briefly introduce myself and the reason behind this series. Uh, I am a lecturer and a researcher of urban and regional planning at the University of Catania in Sicily, which is a region of southern Italy. And thanks to a European funded project, I'm virtually at the University of Liege as visiting researcher. And together with Professor Manuelina Duarte, we have started a collaboration that has generated the idea of this webinar series which is organized also with Martina Barcelloni Corte and a group of students that are volunteering for translation and other commitments. And before starting, please let me just thank them for all the amazing and great job that they are doing helping with this uh, organization. So this webinar series has been organized in order to dig into theories, to map cases and experiences related with the relations between people, heritage, landscape and museums. And through this series, we are trying to open up a space of discussion of transnational and transdisciplinary connections and reflections for understanding how people and museum people relate with the signs of the past and how these various types of relations can shape can be means for shaping a better future so we are exploring this very broad topic from multiple perspectives and today we are going to focus on three important aspects three key aspects which are social inclusion migration and participatory approaches to museology and we'll do that thanks to our great guests. They'll give us various examples and insights on how museums can be means for processes of reconciliation. So I'm going to introduce them in the same order, which will be the order they will be presenting. Um, we start with Andrea de la Plas, PhD in Museum Studies and Heritage at the University of Paris in La Sorbonne, under the direction of Professor Dominique Poulot. And today, Andrea will talk about heritage and immigration and how to put the concept and the, the question and the topic of immigration into the museum. And then we we'll listen to Obey Albitar, Obey is an art historian and museologist. He specializes in museography of Islamic art. He's um, very passionate about fostering intercultural dialogue between the Orient and the West. And uh, his focus is on the social political role of museums and of cultural institutions. And today he's going to talk about the participatory approach in the Museum of Immigration in Brussels. And last but not least, we listen to Gabriela Aidar. And Gabriela is the coordinator of the inclusive educational programs of the Education Department of Pinacoteca de São Paulo in Brazil. And she graduated in history and holds a Master of Arts in Museum Study at Leicester University. And today she will focus on developing social committed practices in the traditional museums with the, um, presenting the experience of the Pinacoteca de São Paulo in Brazil. And now I leave the floor to the first speaker, who is Andrea de la Plas. And uh, there will be time for questions and answers after the three, the three presentations of today. So please, all, the, all your questions, uh, we will have time at the end of the presentation. So Andrea, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hello, and thank you all for being here today. Um, Jose, I'll just ask you please to, as I cannot pass the PowerPoint, feel free to pass the point, PowerPoint little by little. Uh, you'll be seeing on the PowerPoint general information on the three museums I worked on during my PhD. But today I won't be speaking uh, necessarily about those three museums. I'll be speaking more largely about 
exhibitions talking about migration. So there was a title spot today when we're speaking about the museum in Sao Paulo, but about, about the general exhibition. Okay. Uh, immigration can you see the screen? Sorry? Can, can you see the screen? Yes, yes, it's perfect. Okay. Thank okay. you very much, Julie. This is perfect. Thank you. Um, immigration museums are confronted with the challenge of how to put on display a non-static phenomenon by nature, the continual displacement, the non-place. How to create a museography that shows the inconstancy of immigration? The moving frames follow a mosaic of destinies to contribute, despite everything, to go from a plurality sorry, of crossed memories to a shared memory. If the reference to a national narrative is not always as explicit in immigration museums, those responsible for the museography were always conscious of the importance of the overall story these institutions were seeking, seeking to tell. Narrative and display on immigration museums are essential to create a more understanding society regarding migration and especially at the moment with the ongoing migration crisis in Europe and in the Mediterranean. Recent work in critical museum studies has shown that immigration museums can use objects and strategies of display to transmit positive representations of immigration, promoting diversity and a more inclusive national identity as propagating a better knowledge of the subject. The idea is to see the museum as a space for perception of images and representation. What is the representation of immigration that is given to see in these museums? In this paper, I will present different topics that are recurrent when analyzing the permanent exhibitions of different migration museums to try to identify its common structural points and to show how immigration is represented. The idea is also to see the museum as a space for perception of Im images and representations, as I, said, I just said. Staging and displays are essential to understanding the production of museum discourse. It is the whole spatial arrangement, the layout and presentation of the objects and documents, as well as all the text and the catalog, that produce a message, a speech, to be interpreted by the visitor. In the exhibition, meaning is therefore intrinsically dependent on staging and uh, staging the space as the arrangement of things in order to allow access to a certain information in this course. Therefore, one can assume that in examining the exhibition design, it is possible to identify some recurring elements that structure and characterize their display and narrative. So now I'm going to talk mainly about the recurring theme that structure, structure sorry, normally the migration exhibition um, in general. The exhibition analyzed uh, during my PhD uh, included different scenographies, but the topics discussed remain the same when we talk about migration. So from these different permanent exhibitions that I analyzed, uh, we could see that the departure was one of the recurrent themes, the journey and border, the journey and border crossing, also another recurrent thematic, arrival and sorting process with local authorities, so the medical visits, refusal or acceptance of entry into the host country, the adaptation, uh, so if it, uh, the, the migrants are able to create a new route, a new um, uh, integrated uh, identity in the new host country, and contemporary migration. These themes basically function as threads for the museum's narration, uh, recounting the experience of migrating. Maps and chronological context, um, such as timelines, are also presented to the visitor as historical support. Uh, for example, in the French Museum, the permanent exhibition Frotter uh, focuses precisely on small objects slipped into the pocket before departure. A strong, a strong emphasis is placed on individual memories and personal narratives of departure and travel. The migration experience is presented at an individual level, especially when we look at the Galaxy building that now is closed, as I said, uh, on Friday. That, uh, different from uh, the permanent exhibitions of the Ellis Island Museum in New York and the Museo de Migración in Sao Paulo, which support their museum narrative on the building's history 
and the path of the immigrant upon arrival uh, in the spaces of passage and um, because the, as, as I said, those places, there were places that used to receive migrants. So they have the, the Le de Memoir uh, printed in their narrative. And it, it is different from other type of exhibitions like in the French Museum, where uh, we're not talking about uh, Le de Memoir, uh, because um, it's not a place that receives migrants, but the exhibition is more uh, uh, organized around those uh, thematics. Um, so if we look closely to the thematics, for example, the journey, another master theme central to the migrant experience is the grand narrative of the journey. The voyage is the hit de passage that transforms and conditions the varied status of the individual who migrates. To migrate is to cross a sea, an ocean, a desert, a mountain. The journey is sometimes dangerous uh, to reach this uh, unknown land, or the new land for the, the migrant. Uh, which will become his new home. Like the mix uh, in which the hero makes an initiatory journey, uh, even when he re even if he returns to his point of depar departure, his native country, he is profoundly transformed by this experience. So the thematic of the departure and the journey are very, very important when talking uh, about migration. And that's why museums normally use this as a starting point to their own narrative on on migration. Um, another point as well that it's uh, very uh, important, uh, it's the the idea that migration is a human phenomenon, the, the idea of a human diaspora, let's say. Uh, the issue of migration as part of human nature is often presented to the public to highlight the natural, in the brackets, origin of the phenomenon. Uh, for example, the Museo de Immigración in São Paulo starts its permanent exhibition with this theme under the name of Diaspora Humana, Human Diaspora. They present a video where the visitor can see the different migration groups that humanity used since prehistoric times to populate the earth. Another museum that also deals with this, and it's not one of the three museums that we're seeing in the information now on the slides, is the Red Star Line Museum that we spoke last Friday, the one in Anvers. And um, this museum also presents a chronology, a chronology sorry, from antiquity to today to show how human migrations have always existed and how cultural exchanges are essential for humankind. Another very important thematic that we see in, uh, generally in, in exhibitions talking about migration is the, the, the migrant as workforce, as labor. So the, the theme of, of labor, uh, du travail uh, en français, is also central in immigration museums since the vast majority of a paid position of, of uh, regular employment is one of the reasons why uh, people migrate. So workplaces, formal or informal, remain the most important places of integration for migrants, refugees in their new country. Therefore, it is an important thematic when displaying migration history. So another example uh, from one of the museums that I studied, so in, the, in its permanent exhibitions, the Musée National de l'Histoire de l'Immigration and the Museo de Immigration show the importance of work in creating a new network for the newly arriving migrants. By presenting working tools among other artifacts, these museums point to the relevance of migrants as a working force helping to build economic prosperity in their new home country. So a second part now that I'm going to focus on is the iconic object, the importance of the object as a memorial support. So these themes presented, uh, that I just presented now, are often linked visually to the staging of a series of iconic objects, usually personal items such as luggage, travel documents, passports, migrant, migrants' letters, clothes, or toys for babies and children. These objects are frequently used for their effective visual impact and their immediate connection with the themes of the exhibition. They are rarely of a historical or artistic value in themselves, Still, they embody the memory of migration and have a strong visual impact. In exhibitions dealing with the theme of immigration, whether temporary or permanent exhibitions, this um, mise en scène evokes the migrant experience. 
This presentation of objects is therefore characterized by a desire to immerse the visitor in the museum narrative and thus create a sensory link between the displays and the visitor. The suitcase remained the iconic object of the immigration par excellence. Whether presented alone or in support of interactive devices, it represents the magic box that contains the objects chosen by the immigrant during his departure and who will accompany him on his journey to, to always remind him of his origin. The moment of departure is crucial for those who decide to leave their country and to embark on the unknown, that is the journey, generous, dangerous as I said before in many cases, to access a new life. Once the sorting of memories and objects to bring with oneself, the two me, I'm very, very sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, but the connection is really bad. I just wanted to ask if it's like that for the others as well. Unfortunately, yes, uh, because there is a noise that we are hearing. Ah, okay. Yes. This is that is the problem I have with the computer, as I said before. Even if I speak louder and close to you, can you listen to me or is just... No, it's better. If you speak louder, it's better, I think. Yes, okay. now it's better for me as well. It's very interesting what you're saying. I just would like to understand more. That's why I'm interrupting. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. So today we had, we had this problem the last time. Um, so I'm going to try to speak then louder. Um, so the, um, the moment of departure is crucial for those who decide to leave their country and to embark on the unknown. That is this journey. Uh, once the sorting of memories and objects to bring with oneself, the suitcase presents itself as the sacred receptacle of these precious memories of our world, which will remain in the past of those who leave. Thus, the suitcase would be this container that contains memory objects chosen by their personal symbolic importance, real relics that are supported to recall and to a certain extent put in contact with the one who processes them with his past and his family. The crossing to the unknown is done, is done with the suitcase and the relics it contains, symbol of the traveler and also of the immigrant into his exile or into his um, new life in a new country. Museums uh, often uh, ask visitors at the end of the exhibitions what would be the object they would choose to bring with them if they were to leave their home country forever. This choice is very personal and intimate, but some objects are quite common, such as family photographic albums. Um, another point that I want to fo focus on, as I have to, to be quite concise now, is the architectural context of immigration museums that often complement the visual communication of the displays inside the exhibitions. These museums are usually located in places that have a history related to migration, such as docklands, ports, uh, border or departure um, areas, and museums are located are also um, located in, in general, not always, but in general, in historical buildings connected with stories of migration and bury itself a memory of migration, uh, making them very emblematic buildings. And as I spoke before, the lieu de mémoire. It is necessary to historicize these uh, memorial spaces and this um, also another term uh, that I like is the term I, I couldn't really translate to English, so I'll say in French, lieu de passage, uh, transit spaces um, such as ports, train stations, airports, but also temporary constructions created to hold and control migrants while releasing their, um, their deep social anthropological sense. These were Sorry, the, I thought I'm a little bit lost. So these were processed and had their destinies changed forever uh, inside the, these places. So, for example, as we said last week, the Migration Museum in Sao Paulo and Alice Island are both so in the in buildings. There are uh, the Lieu de Memoir, the Lieu de Passage. So the migrants passed through there. We also spoke about the Red Star Line Museum. So it is also a museum that is close to a port. 
to a Dockland, and it also is a building related to uh, the the history of uh, of migration in this uh, in this area. So, as a conclusion, uh, um, we can say that artworks, personal items, audio video testimonials, real scale re real scale risk reconstructions, common iconic objects such, such as suitcases and passport, and highly scenographic and interactive displays are often used in the new museography presented by immigration or immigration museums. Their visual impact makes it easier to understand and remember what's on display. All these exhibit solutions are largely characterized by the intention to stimulate empathy in the visitor toward the story told and aimed at achieving a greater vis visitor involvement. involvement sorry. Also, the visual language adopted is different when the exhibition deals with contemporary migration rather than with historical migration. I won't have time to develop this today, but it's something that during my research, uh, visiting different museums, not only the three museums that, uh, that I uh, wrote uh, during my, te my thesis, um, I, I saw that there is a little bit of a difference, also a visual difference when displaying contemporary migrations and uh, more historical, let's say, migrations, migration from the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 19th century. Um, but anyway, both undoubtedly work in creating a strong synergy with the museum narrative and the collection. Never, nevertheless, by repeating the same thematic approaches and using the same iconic uh, objects. Uh, hence, migration museums uh, should encourage uh, more multivocal projects and exhibitions, engaging, uh, engaging them with different migrant communities to collaborate uh, with them. Uh, I would like also to do just one last mention, and we, maybe we can discuss this better uh, during the question part, that uh, finally, museums dedicated to the history of immigration remain quite recent initiatives, so from the last 30, 40 years, uh, in the international museum landscape. But as the theme is gaining in importance in the international political scenario due to the current migration crisis, they are gaining space in contemporary discussions on heritage and social inclusion. Even though some museum professionals argue that the ideal scenario would be to include the history of immigration in national history museums, or city museums, instead of having a museum dedicated to immigration itself, at the moment it is essential to have a platform to discuss and reflect on immigration as well as on the migratory phenomenon in our contemporary societies. With the growing role of museums as social actors, immigration museums could turn into this um, platform really for discussion, for reflection on the socioeconomic inclusion of immigrants and refugees. And when talking of the museology of reconciliation, the thematic of today's uh, presentations, we have to think of, we have to think, sorry, of how migration museums are trying to create a link in between the different communities, sometimes around the area of the museum and the museum space. Thus, thus opening up to become a space, a space. <laughs> that fosters social justice and dialogue in between different cultures and social backgrounds. Thank you very much for your time and sorry for the noise. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And now it is um, Obey Albitar, the floor is yours. I think you can share the screen, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be part of this excellent series of webinars, and I'd like to thank Madame Manuelina Duarte and uh, Gizzi Babalardo for organizing it. Um, so the topic of my talk is the participatory approach of the Museum of Migration in Molenbeek in Brussels. So it's a relatively new museum that opened end of 
2019. Um, during the presentation, we will be talking about the particip about participation, immigration, and the hopes and aspirations for a new museum of, of immigration. Then we will talk about the Museum of Migration, its mission and its participatory approach. And then we finally conclude with some thoughts and ideas about how can we develop certain aspects of the museum. So in the Participatory Museum by Nina Simon, published in 2010, she identifies participation as a relationship between the institution, the participants and the public, where the goals and objectives of each party is met. For her, the participatory project needs to be included in the framework of the institutions, taking into account the needs of the participants and the public. So why a participatory approach? It invites people to be part of our cultural heritage. And instead of being a passive consumer, participation invites the public to be actively engaged as a cultural participant. While visiting an exhibition or a museum, we consume the content and then we leave. Participation generates an engagement between visitors and the institution in order to develop the content. Participation enhances and does not replace the content of the institution. By offering a place for collective creation, visitors can contribute their own ideas and expressions to the institution and to each other. They discuss and redistribute both what they see and what they make during their visit all while offering a social experience by engaging people with each other and the staff members of the museum to connect around the content of the institution. Finally, the institution becomes an inclusive space where everyone is heard and everyone feels represented. Uh, in her book, Nina Simon identifies three types of participation. The first one being uh, the contribution, it can be more personalized and voluntary contribution to the content of the exhibition. It also can be edited by the museum staff, but it offers an inclusive dimension in the exhibition. The second type is collaboration, and it's more identified as a committed relationship between the institution and the participants. Participants can play the role of advisors who have been chosen because of a specific experience and expertise. And the third type is the co-creation. It's a partnership in order to meet the objectives of both participants and the institution. Community members would meet with the institution or the other way around with an idea and an objective in mind that satisfies both needs of the institution and the community. The institution gives more power to the participants, which results in a project that is both co-developed and co-owned by this partnership. So before discussing the Museum of Migration and its participatory approach, let's contextualize the need for a Museum of Migration in Brussels in the first place. So Belgium consists of three regions, Flanders in the north, Wallonia in the south, and the region of Brussels capital. The Brussels capital region is divided into 19 municipalities with the city of Brussels as its capital. The population of Brussels is estimated to be around 2.1 million inhabitants, of which nearly 70% are non-Belgian. More than half of the non-Belgian population is non-European. So with almost 180 different nationalities and 108 languages spoken, migration is the most important demographic factor influencing the composition of Brussels' population. With that being said, does it mean that participation should be easy? I mean, we need to keep in mind that not all visitors want to participate. So how can we encourage them to participate? Um, so also, what can a new museum of immigration offer? In a study that was published in 2016 entitled Migratory Movements and the Dynamics of Neighborhoods in Brussels, Zone, or as it was articulated, was identified in the south of Brussels, encompassing several municipalities such as saint just Molenbeek, Anderlecht, and saint gilles the, These disadvantaged neighborhoods were identified according to the social and economic characteristic of the residents, such as income, national origin, difficulties integrating into the labor market, and household dependence on welfare. On top of these factors is also a strong demographic pressure due to the substantial influx of immigrants to these poorest neighborhoods. 
These factors are interconnected, and this is where a new museum of migration can play an active social role by providing a platform to the community and to raise awareness about migrant issues. Unfortunately, this new museum concept it was missing the Museum of Migration in Brussels. So the Museum of Migration first opened its door on October 12, 2019. It offers a, it offers a permanent home to the stories of first generation mi immigrants, be they economic migrants, expats, refugees, asylum seekers, or any other type of migrant, regardless of national origin. The focus here is on first generation immigrants. We will come back to this point later on before the conclusion. Um, the museum house is a collection consisting of stories, testimonies, photographs, photographs and objects that are presented together to give an intimate and personal journey through people's memories and lives. The collection on display is renewed every six to eight months. Since it's a participatory museum, they invite people to share their stories to be added later on in the permanent exhibition. The collection also includes modern artworks and installation. The primary target audience consists first of school students and then Belgian and non-Belgian audiences who relate to or are concerned about the topic of immigration. Finally, it's important to highlight that the museum can be visited and appreciated by everyone. It is accessible to people of varying socioeconomic status and educational background, employing different modes of narration and storytelling. So, for example, the short text, the usage of, so of short text and interactive media would help convey the narrative in an easier way. Um, so the Museum of Migration was founded by Foyer. It's a non-profit organization created in 1969 to provide migrant families with administrative support, French and Dutch language instruction, and other support aimed at increasing social integration. Today, Foyer's mission has evolved to focus on building an inclusive and intercultural society shaped by its members. They offer programs aimed at integrating young migrants into the labor market, providing education to do slack and formal education, and promoting notions of shared citizenship. For their 50th anniversary, Fayette channeled their expertise and worked with migrant communities into the creation of the Museum of Migration. The museum has a double mission to highlight the ethnic diversity and multiculturalism of Brussels and to raise awareness about issues surrounding migration. And this is where both Fayette and the museum's mission of bringing awareness and provoking reflection and discussion on migrants. And the Museum of Migration strive to play a role in social change and contribute to a better understanding of migrants. So the visit of the museum consists of three steps. Upon entering the museum, visitors are greeted by various forms of modern installation, which encourage the visitors to leave their prejudices at the door and maintain an accepting and an open mind over the course of their visit. Then the visit of the museum starts at the first floor with a uh, permanent collection and then to the and it will and continues to the second floor with the um, temporary exhibit exhibition. And at the end of the visit or at the end of the exhibition, visitors return to the main floor where there is a space dedicated uh, to reflection and discussion of the contents of the exhibition. So um, the Museum of Migration is not a museum of history. The museum does not encompasses an exhaustive history of immigration. As an educational tool targeting student audiences, it aims to be more accessible and more relevant to the present day. The timeline begins with the arrival of migrant worker, workers in 1963 and it ends in, and, um, and ends in 2015 with the influx of asylum seekers at the height of the European migration crisis. This timeline is accompanied by archival documents, video footage and photos that highlight the demographic development of Brussels as the most diverse in Belgium. The museum focuses on providing a participatory experience rather than a historical visit of the entire history of immigration. The timeline, furthermore, the timeline raises certain issues in chronological order that are not developed in the exhibition itself, such as migrants taking job 
jobs and desirable to Belgians, ongoing division between Belgian and non-Belgian communities, and unemployment and employment and housing discrimination. Issues that are still present in Belgian society, but not addressed specifically as a subject in the exhibition. So this is where we try to analyze the, uh, the participatory approach of the museum. When it comes to the collection, the participation is more evident. The museum reaches out to the community and communicates its vision and the premise of the project. Over the course of three years, the museum met with almost 100 people, each of whom t told their story, which was transcribed by the staff member, who then sent it back to the participant to be verified. The participant then had the opportunity to modify the content and provided permission for the story to, uh, to be part of the exhibition. When it comes to the objects, the decision is made through a dialogue between the staff and the participants. These objects are given to be exhibited next to the testimonies of the participants. So when it comes to the narrative of the exhibition as a whole, it's less straightforward. While the contents of the exhibition are primarily based on individual testimonies, the overall narrative of the exhibition itself are primarily, primarily based on individual, tes individual testimonies. Oh, sorry. The overall narrative of the exhibition itself is developed by the museum. Subjects and themes raised by, um, by participant testimonies nonetheless influences decisions regarding the narrative of the exhibit, often adding a new layer to the various themes already covered. At the same time, certain stories that align with the narrative version set out by the museum may be highlighted more than others. Although, decision, although decisions about the overall narrative are ultimately up to the museum organizers. So as I mentioned earlier, a co-creation or a collaborative participation would imply an act of engagement with the community, either by giving more power to the community itself or by having a representative of the community to play the role of advisor. In the case of the museum, both of these aspects were absent. But as a participatory museum, the participation and the narrative by participants can still play an important role beyond just the contents of the collection. So yeah, this is certain ideas and thoughts that I would like to share with you. The first one is regarding the continuity of the narrative. So by focusing on the stories of first generation of immigrants, we are provided with a picture that was taken at a certain time and place, the story, which is the story of immigrants arrival in Brussels. However, we are being deprived of the stories of the subsequent generations, for example, the second generation immigrants. Their difficulties and struggles, while different from their parents, are vital to a better understanding, persisting mar marginalization and divisions in Belgian society. Uh, the second idea is regarding uh, the museum's approach based on empathy, as uh, Andrea was talking about earlier. So the museum identifies itself as an empathic museum. The testimonies of the first generation immigrants center around the reason of their displacement, whether it was political, economic reasons or other. By focusing primarily on immigrants' hardship, the museum gives a one-dimensional and uh, unbalanced representation of the immigrant. This kind of representation, already pervasive in mass media and the political landscape, risk, uh, risks reinforcing a savior narrative. Such a limited narrative lacking in nuance and strongly relying on empathy does doesn't allow us to identify with, with the hopes, aspiration and dreams intrinsic to the migrant experience. In my opinion, we need to think more of a counter approach that will balance the way we represent migrants and immigration. Finally, with regard, well, I first have to be more precise that the museum or the narrative in the museum is also trying to be neutral. Uh, so with regard to neutrality, the question of immigration and migration leads to a whole series of reflections on integration 
on domination, on power dynamics, social or economic inequality, identity, whether it was imposed, adopted or claimed. Faced with these questions, can a participatory museum be neutral? Um, so instead of a conclusion, I thought it would be more productive to open a dialogue about what can we do to address some of the shortcomings of the Museum of Migration. So first, what can the public do? The public can go visit the museum, the public can support its mission by becoming participants themselves and sharing their stories, enriching the museum's collection and, di and diversifying the narrative of the exhibition. Then, what can the participants do? Beyond sharing their personal stories of migration, become more actively engaged in decision-making by sharing their perspectives and ideas for potential projects to be developed in the museum. And finally, what can the museum do? The museum can be open to a more horizontal power structure, where the museum sees participants as more equal stakeholders in the direction of the museum. Furthermore, the museum can encourage greater public engagement beyond the sharing of personal stories about migration. For example, the public having more of a say in deciding what migrant issues are addressed and what form such representation would take. This would mean a move away from the neutral stance taken by the Museum of Migration towards one that is a more accurate reflection of the communities they are seeking to represent. Thank you so much for your attention, for your time. Thank you, Vey. And now, Gabriella, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, good afternoon. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. I thank uh, Manuelina, Duarte, and Giuseppe Papalardo for the invitation for me to take part in this series of webinars with such relevant themes and participants. Now I'll try to share my screen with you. Let's see here. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, okay. So I'm not speaking about uh, an immigration museums, but I hope uh, what I have to present to you will connect somehow to what our uh, friends presented previously. So what my presentation aims is to problematize the relationships between the museological practice of traditional museums and the assumptions of a more socially committed museology, pointing out its limitations and potentialities. To do so, I will use as an example the social educational practices that the education department of the Pinacoteca de São Paulo, the museum where I work in this Brazilian city, has carried out with groups of homeless people and also with people deprived of their liberty or incarcerated people over the last years. The experiences of social museology generally fit into the practice of community museums, territory museums or eco-museums, distancing themselves from the actions developed by more traditional institutions. I therefore find it interesting to question the role of traditional museums in the processes of social and critical museology. Is it possible to think of social museological practice, practices within these institutions? Or should we renounce a more socially engaged action in traditional museums and accept their roles as legitimizers of hegemonic discourses in favor of the dominant classes. One of the most common questions asked, asked to traditional museums that seek to develop processes that generate social impacts on disadvantaged groups has to do with what they make available to the public. And I think uh, Obey's presentation somehow related to, to this too. This is a discussion that refers to the idea of democratization of culture, as if developing social projects uncritically were to assume a posture of cultural indoctrination, in which we stimulate the cultural consumption of non-attending groups in order to popularize the erudite and dominant culture of museums, seen as necessary to the entire population. 
according to a Greek researcher uh, living in Portugal called Maria Vlachou, there are also many of us who advocate access, but access to what we define as valid culture. Still, what if we try to get to know better the communities in which we are inserted? What if we, we opened up our spaces, which are also theirs, involving them, creating comfort, physical, psychological, and intellectual, and a feeling of belonging? What if we program together with them? What if the artists were them? Here, we touch on the issue of cultural democracy in its sense of not ranking the manifestations of culture and providing access more to cultural production than to its consumption, favoring the participation of the public not only as spectators, but as active agents. Quoting Vlachot in another text, working with people does not mean giving people what they want. It means being sensitive to what interests, worries, concerns, brings joy to the community that surrounds us and seeking to build programming that allow us, allows us to reflect together on all this. Although it's natural to think of a clear dichotomy between these two points of view and, pro and their proposals, it is possible and even very common to see in the daily life of museums tendencies that mix the two possibilities at the same time, especially when we are within more traditional institutions. Thus, it is possible to have in the same museum actions aimed at the popularization of its official culture while implementing projects developed from the demands of particular groups and communities. In this sense, I believe the professional areas of traditional museums that are most active developing social actions are the educational teams. Historically, they have been responsible for developing outreach and participation actions with the institution's audience, something that's not generally perceived as a responsibility of the institution as a whole. As Vahim states in a 2008 article, many classical museums, from the initial impulses given by scientific, technical or industry museums, have progressively adopted, even outside their strategies and programs, the perspectives of mediation, in order to adapt their methods of communication, management and education to different audiences, with clearly social objectives, cultural integrations, cultural integration of immigrant populations, citizen involvement, information, or even consultation on public policies, admission of people with disabilities, etc. Based on my professional experience since 2002 in the education department of the Pinacoteca de São Paulo, a public art museum in this Brazilian city, I believe that what traditional museums have to offer, even within their institutional and historical limitations, can be potentially relevant for everyone, depending on the approach and the quality of the contact with heritage, which can be more or less conscious and critical, as well as on the possibilities of approaching the institution and its teams and the resulting relationships. Moreover, contradiction can be installed from within through the questioning of official discourses. In this sense, community-based museums have more freedom and better opportunities to experiment with accessible and collaborative, collaborative management and working processes. But the possibilities for audience participation and dialogue with museums are varied and more traditional institutions can and should undertake them. The renewal of certain museological practices within traditional institutions is a challenge to be faced and social educational processes are part of this effort. Even if we draw on some of the commitments of social museology, we know that they can be adopted by any type and nature of museum. Among them, 
reducing social injustice, injustices and inequalities, combating prejudice, improving the quality of collective life, strengthening dignity and social cohesion, and harnessing the power of memory, heritage and the museum for the benefit of the working class communities. To exemplify this point of view, I will quickly introduce you to the Pinacoteca de São Paulo and its context. It is the oldest art museum in São Paulo, founded in 1905. It is a public institution belonging to the state of São Paulo, but privately managed. It has a collection of around 10,000 works of art, mainly Brazilian art, from the 17th century to the present day. It is located in the, city, the old city center, in a neighborhood with good infrastructures and various public and private facilities. It is within a public park, as you can see in this photo, adjacent to low income neighbors in poor living conditions, but also to important commercial areas. And is also part of a cultural hub that includes five museums and a concert hall. Here you can see some interior images of the museum and its exhibition spaces, with long-term exhibitions of the collection, as in the image on the right, and also temporary exhibitions like the site-specific work uh, in the image on the left, made by a Brazilian artist called José Espanol. Here is how we structure the Pinacotecas Education Department. We have two main areas of action established according to their target audiences. The first is called school and general public programs with programs aimed at uh, currently visiting audiences, which develop, well, not currently because we are in the, I mean, uh, we are closed because of the pandemic, but with visiting audiences, traditionally, vi traditionally visiting audiences, which develops actions mainly with schools teachers and students, as well as family groups and spontaneous visitors. And the second area from, for which I, I, from which I am responsible is the inclusive educational programs aimed at non-traditional museum visitors, which develop continuous actions with groups of people in situations of social vulnerability, many of them from the museum surroundings, people with disabilities and in psychological distress, people aged, aged 60 and over, as well as the museum's own staff, in particular the reception, cleaning and security teams. In the context of this webinar and after discussing it with Manuelina, it seems more relevant to share the social educational experience we have developed, as I said, with homeless people and with people in prisons. So uh, the first example is an outreach educational action, one of our long-term projects carried out since uh, 2008 with two groups of homeless adults, users of social assistant institutions in the vicinity of the museum. It consists of weekly art workshops with an emphasis on graphic arts and woodcuts. This project is structured through workshops in the two organizations of the participants and regular visits to the museum's exhibitions. The option of working with this target audience is in direct dialogue with the surroundings of the Pinacoteca, since groups of homeless people normally circulate in the central areas of the city. Thus, our interest is to establish closer and more productive relation with these groups, since we are geographically close, although socially distant. The choice of art workshops was made when we realized that this kind of artistic activity was almost non-existent for this target group. Finally, we chose graphic arts because of our previous experience with these groups and our knowledge of some of their cultural repertoires or backgrounds, linked to the popular tradition of woodcut prints from the northeastern states of the country, the region where Manuelina is from. 
which is also the region of origin of a large part of the migrant population of Sao Paulo of, and of the entire country. In addition, woodcutting uses materials and procedures that are closer to the everyday life of, of someone who ha has already worked in construction or car carpentry, for example. As it is a long-term project, it has already generated a whole series of results, such as exhibitions at the Pinacoteca, like the one on the left, called Living Together, with, which presented the produ production of the participants on display at the museum in 2009, and in the picture on the right, we, see, we can see large woodcut prints which were installed on the windows of the side facade of the museum building in front of the public park next to the museum, which is very much attended by vulnerable groups in the city centre. These panels were exhibited between 2011 and 2012. These, all these displays allowed visitors to the Pinacoteca and the neighbouring park to get to know the project, while at the same time providing positive social visibility for homeless people who are subject to a series of social stereotypes. We also uh, organize other exhibitions outside the Pinacoteca, such as traveling exhibitions in towns in the state of Sao Paulo, as shown in the image of the left, on the left or other uh, displays in public spaces, such as the imaging on the right, which shows the participants on the opening day of the display of woodcut panels printed on canvas, a technique called block printing, which were exhibited in a bandstand next to the museum, the, the Pinacoteca building inside the park in 2017. In, the, in this case, the choice of the graphic technique, block printing, as well as the place of displaying the panels, was made by the participants in the projects who chose to have their work exhibited in a public, public place with free circulation. Finally, the project has produced a number of publications, ranging from documentary and evaluative publications to others depicting images and texts made by the participants. Unfortunately, this is an eminently face-to-face -face project and therefore since March last year it had to be temporarily discontinued because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So now we go to the second example, which is the social educational experience we have developed with incarcerated adults, men and women deprived of their liberty. Through a partnership we have since 2017 with the Department of Penitentiary Administration of the State of Sao Paulo. It is important to say that Brazil has the third largest world, world number of incarcerated people, behind only the United States and China, with a prison population of around 727,000 people in 2017. About 32% of the country's total number of imprisoned persons were incarcerated in the state of Sao Paulo, or almost 230,000 people. The work done with socially vulnerable groups has shown us that persons deprived of their liberty are invisible, invisible and socially undesirable groups deprived of their most basic human rights. For this very reason, they are groups that should not be ignored by cultural institutions that understand their cultural action as a social one. Four different actions were developed with the Department of Penitentiary Administration. Administration. In 2017, a series of meetings with imprisoned people from the semi-open prison regime at the headquarters of this department resulted in an exhibition mounted by the group in which they re reinterpret reproductions of artworks from the museum based on their experiences in and out of prison. We can see in the image, in the image on the left the invitation for this exhibition, which is open in the presence of the families of the participating prisoners and another photo of the exhibition opening day. 
2019, the Pinacoteca, Pinacoteca team held five meetings in a woman's prison, promoting artistic experimentation and debate on identity issues, as well as securing, securing the release for an educational visit to the Pinacoteca by a group of 15 incarcerated women, most of whom were visiting a museum for the first time in their lives. The image on the left shows a participant's artistic production, a collage, based on elements of Afro-Brazilian culture, and on the right, the group's visit to the museum. Last year, we started an action that consisted of silkscreen printing workshops and also group discussions on themes related to the personal and collective, collective identity of the participants. From this action, a traveling exhibition of collaborative, collaborative curatorship was programmed with the results of the, these workshops in three prisons in the city of Sao Paulo, which will have the mediation of the authors and a publication about the process, probably a catalog. The proposal is to take a museum exhibition made by the incarcerated persons to the prisons, with the idea that if they cannot come to the museum, the museum will come to them. The art workshops and group discussions be began in February last year at the headquarters of the Department of Penitentiary Administration. We could held seven workshops, which were interrupted in mid-March due to the pandemic. This affected, of course, the entire schedule of this project and we maintain the plan to complete the workshops and hold the exhibitions most likely next year, health conditions permitting. But in order to continue our actions with the prison population, even during the pandemic, this year we are preparing educational visits to the museum recorded on video to be shown in prisons with themes linked to memory, identities and freedom. Mass, mass incarceration in Brazil does not necessarily imply the development and provision of services and opportunities for these groups to exercise their cultural rights. Thus, proposing social, educational and cultural actions within the prison system goes beyond the benefits that such actions promote, such as that knowledge acquisition, skills development, sociability, personal empowerment, opportunity for dialogue and expression to achieve the promotion of human rights. So to conclude um, the consideration on the development of socially committed action by actions by traditional museums, I believe that the major challenge is to extend the impact of these processes on the rigid organizational structures and the logics of operation and power within the more traditional museums, transforming them. I mean, this is our utopia somehow. However, it seems to be more noticeable to perceive the positive changes in the participants of the actions than in the museum themselves, which often make or allow these social educational processes to happen, but do not, val do not value them enough to the point of rethinking they, they rethinking their institutional practices. So thank you for your attention. I leave you here my email contact and I hope we can exchange some ideas now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Thank you all the speakers. Sorry again for the problems we had with you know still technological issues, but that's the way we are dealing with this new uh, way of meeting. But in any case, I think it was a really interesting session today with full, full of input. So um, I've collected many questions, but I don't want to start. Now it's your turn. So please raise your hand, open your camera, open your microphone and feel free to ask questions. Who wants to start?
Yes, thank you, Manuelina. So just, of course, you can write your name in the chat. If you have problems using the chat, just raise your hand. You can raise the hand using the team the Teams button or using your physical hand and opening up your camera. OK, Manuelina starts. Don't be shy, the other. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much for this inspiring uh, conference. I'd like to make a question to Andrea and Obey uh, about the, the possible application of this idea of uh, reconciliation museology in European museums. I heard this expression in the a thesis exam of uh, Andrea de la Place in, uh, in uh, the Sorbonne. So, uh, but I think it was expressed by a Canadian. So I'd like to know how how this is, um, uh, if you know Obe and, and uh, Andrea, who is uh, conceptualizing this idea, if, if you have uh, suggestions of other people thinking about this and how how this is being applied in European museums, please. Obey, do you want to go first? Uh, I have you to can go first. first. Do you want to answer first or I have to go? <laughs> Yeah, no, you go first, I'll go I after. go first, okay. So thank you, Manuelino, for the, the question. And as today, I really tried to be very concise. I couldn't develop more. And yes, I think it was this Dr. Holm that talked about this this, uh, this um, term, Museology de la Reconciliation. And I think there, there is an, uh, an interesting project uh, going on in Sweden, uh, in Malmo. And uh, I think it was, uh, I, I haven't been following very closely the development of this project, but I know since I think 2016, 17, they were developing a museum that would talk about migration, trans transnationality, um, multiculturalism. I can't remember the name of the project uh, precisely, that's why I prefer not to say it, I need to confirm it. But uh, what I've been seeing from these discussions is that they were trying to um, have this approach of social justice, not trying to create a project that would be more inclusive and multivocal, and trying to trying really to create this, uh, recon this reconciliation between the different um, uh, different groups uh, inside of a society and uh, to, to create a bridge uh, for dialogue inside the, the museum project. I, I think it would be interesting to maybe go check this project and as Mando Perla, Armando Perla is going to speak uh, also in Babel Tower, I think he was part of this project, he will be able maybe to speak much more uh, uh, you know, much more about it and uh, with much more um, information than I do have. But that's that's what the, the example that came to my mind. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think in my from what I've seen in certain museum, of course, not all of them, but I feel like many museums are still hold into this idea of like or are centered around the object itself and not around the vis the people who don't go that often to the museum and i feel like maybe lately there's been more um contribution or more uh initiative that actually encourages people or where we talk for example more about the decolonization which will open the doors of the museum to everyone and to be more inclusive space. And I feel this is where a lot of in initiative in Brussels some are being created as like a decolonized uh, guided tour in museums. And I feel this might help slowly to reach to a larger audience. But still, when it comes to the narrative itself, I feel this is where we can actually try to develop um, 
something with the community with each in, in, in the museum. And I have an exam, an exam, um, no, an example that comes to my mind. I remember during the um, the Black Lives Matter movement, there was an act of vandalism that happened in the museum of uh, of uh, the Africa Museum or the the Royal Museum of uh, Central Africa in Belgium, where a statue was actually um, um, vandalized with some paint, with some red paint. And this is something that, of course, it's not uh, very encouraged per se, per se. But I think at that moment, the reaction of the museum was actually saying or putting something on Facebook saying that they this kind of, that they condemn condemn this kind of behavior or like this kind of act. However, from my point of view, I feel like the museum could have actually reached out to the community and tried to develop something about this certain or this sort of intervention where it can be exhibited as part of this uh, Black, uh, Black Life Matter movement developed in Belgium, for example, reaching to Belgium. and. This is where the museum didn't go forward with this type of thinking. OK, if um, Manuelina does, if you want to comment or continue, otherwise we have another question. OK, we have Maria Magdalena. Hello. Um, um, actually, I don't have a question. I just wanted to um, say about the project in Malmö because I was in contact with Armando Perla and also Peter Bevelander. And sadly, the Museum of Movement does not move forward anymore. That was in September last year because of the latest government budget proposal. So I just wanted to add that to the discussion. Okay. Unfortunately, I have to say, although I I have another question. In fact, more two questions. One for Gabriela, another for Obey and Andrea again. <laughs> uh, to Gabriela, uh, I'd like uh, to to hear uh, about other experience that I think is very. Uh, innovative in at Pinacoteca, this work you do with the workers of the Pinacoteca, they, this, um, as you say, the public antenna <laughs> of the museum. I, I think this is very important because it's uh, um, a lot of workers that are sometimes very abandoned in the museums and uh, uh, I, I think you, you you really look for the people that is not ha having these eyes over them. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they are not having opportunity to participate more actively of, of the museum, in fact. So I'd like you, you talk a little bit about this. And then uh, Obey and Andre, if you want to comment about uh, uh, how you as immigrants uh, are uh, studying immigrant museums, how, how is this experience? Because we are each time more talking about the representativeness, uh, I, I hope it's like this in English, uh, and um, I, I think it's very interesting to, to, to understand what changed in your view about these immigrant museums because you, you are immigrants and refugees. Thank you. Okay, so the program Manuelina mentions we call staff training program and it has exactly to do with what you mentioned. That's why it's part of the inclusive educational programs uh, section because we see them somehow as non-audiences for as surprisingly as it seems because they are not, they are not uh, regular visits to cultural institutions. And as we understand ourselves as an educational institution, we have to look inside to our colleagues. So we developed this program for many years now, almost 20 years. And the idea is to provide 
a basic uh, training on issues related to the world of museums, like what is what is to collect, what is museology, what is a museum, etc., what's heritage, but also uh, to start um, working with other themes related to the work. So not necessarily about museums, but then uh, having um, visits to other cultural institutions to uh, expand their cultural repertoire and make them also museum and cultural consumers, let's say, and also to see how a security guard works in another place and how do you work and then relate your practice to this other uh, employee and also uh, discuss themes related to education in museums. So because we are creating a demand for non-attending groups, non-traditional visitors, and the entire institution needs to be prepared, not only the educational team. So how we receive um, older visitors or how we receive homeless people or how we receive uh, visually impaired people, deaf visitors. So we have this series of training of how to receive better these non-attending, traditionally non-attending groups. Also, they have uh, lectures with the restoration and conservation staff to perceive things related to conservation inside of the exhibition halls. And then we have something that's really interesting and it has to do with our um, educational strategies, which is really constructive. And it's uh, they started uh, proposing things for us to work as part of the program. So they had lots of complaints of physical uh, complaints because they work eight hours a day in a very cold refrigerated exhibition room. They have complaints of posture and um, physical in pains and uh, things like that. So we started some um, workshops on, I don't know how to say this in Eng English, maybe you can help me, help me to, you know, like posture or when you do how do you say? I'm doing mimic here. <laughs> Alongamento is like... Um, strange. Uh, I don't strength. Uh, when you stretch, exactly. Stretching and things that can provide them more uh, physical well-being during work. So um, the different modules of this program, it's very organic. We, we, we work these modules and the themes of these modules are developed with the museum staff. Uh, and also, and all this work is done during work time, so it's not volunteer participation. The, the teams have to work on, on this because it's considered work, it is part of their work. Um, but then we have some volunteer participation projects and actions like um, artistic experimentation workshop after the, when the museum is closed for who wants to participate on this. And also uh, uh, annually uh, activity with the kids, the, the, the staff, children uh, or grandchildren. And they spend the entire uh, Sunday in the museum having activities and getting to get closer to the museum environment, the work environment of their parents. And it's very important. I mean, we can do any of the, the things we do at the education department without this program because otherwise we will have lots and lots of problems and issues if the, not the entire uh, museum staff is prepared for what we are doing in education. Can I add something in this question? Because I, I heard some years before Gabriela say exactly uh, small problems they are they were having the beginning of this project to bring homeless inside of the museum, for example, because of the staff didn't understand uh, very well in the beginning. So you think this other project uh, with the staff helps to to the other work better? Is this? I think it's a continuous process, you know, it's never done. It's never done. But if you think, at, for example, as for security teams, security staff, many of them are not the regular uh, uh, staff of the museum. Sometimes they change. So it's really a continuous work and they are trained for their professional practice. They're trained all their professional experience, experience to look at like homeless people in a very suspicious way. 
So for them, it's almost, it's not natural, so of course, it's cultural, but it's really their first reaction to these, uh, to these groups of people. So it's really, really, like we say in Portuguese, it's like an ants work. It's like really brick by brick, and we have continuous working. Of course, not everything, everything is solved, but I, I think as these are long-term projects, we have a team at the Pinacoteca, which uh, is more prepared to, to work with these different groups. I would say. Thank you. And now I think it's turn of uh, Obey and Andrea for the previous question. And then we have uh, Violetta after these answers that has a question. Yeah. Um, so regarding the power of representation, which is something that I keep always thinking about, and it's um, during my master, my masters in the University of Liège, I did my thesis in, uh, about the Islamic, the Museum of Islamic Art in Europe, and this is where I try to prove a certain process of thinking that is a certain continuation of representation of the representation of the other in. When it comes to Islamic art, it's always uh, a representation that comes from the collective imaginary and Orientalists in the scenography and the architecture. And this is something that I'm tr what I noticed that just became a way of thinking that every time we think about Islamic culture, we always have this also idea of Aladdin and all of these Orientalist thoughts that actually it just became in our mind. And when it comes to immigration, ever since um, the height of the immigration crisis in Europe, we keep seeing this kind of discourse in the media and the political landscape where they always talk about um, the narrative, like it's, which is real, the narrative of like trying to help people, but at the same time, it's way to enforce this savior narrative that is like still available even after or like still present, even when people arrives here. And it's way, and it feels like it's a little bit counterproductive or it's not very efficient when faced to people who are concerned by these issues. And it's and especially when there's no continuity, when I talk about like other migration and generation and they're the issues that are still present and this is why I feel the representation is still not um, equal or not balanced. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let uh, Andrea reply to the question. Uh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I think well, like, I'll talk more about uh, my personal life a little bit. I shared that recently with Obey in a personal discussion we had, but like I think my interest in migration museums come from comes from my uh, personal background in a way that I come from a multicultural family. My last name is de La Place because my dad uh, was French, so my dad died recently, um, um, sadly. Um, but uh, my dad was French. He moved uh, to Brazil. Uh, when he got married to my mom. And funnily enough, my mom's family, she was born in Brazil, but my mom's family also is a migration, <laughs> has a migration history because her na last name is Jovanovic, which is originally from the ex Yugoslavia. Her grandparents migrated from uh, Greece and uh, the region of Macedonia. So it was very funny because I was raised in this family where. You know, I had the two different names for in Brazil. I remember every time people would say, ah, the girl with the funny names, uh, Jovanovic de la Plata, oh, they're not normally Brazilian names. And at home, we used to speak French because my dad really want us, wanted us to, to, to speak French uh, fluently. And he also uh, enrolled us, me and my sister, in the in the French school in Sao Paulo. And so I, 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 I was raised up in this um, really multicultural family, and it, I always, I always got interested into this. That's why I think I chose anthropology later on as my my um, graduate undergraduate studies, and then my master's studies. And and so for me, it was very interesting always to see how 
uh, depending on the country you live on and the uh, the family you come from and the the, the your your uh, entourage how you 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 see you see the world how you you were presenting and how you know uh, sometimes we 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 are in uh, in situations where we see representations that you know try to put everyone inside a little box we were talking with the, about this together with the day uh, and and that bothers me just having to put everyone inside of a little box because then it's easier you know identity is just you're this and that's it and we don't talk about the multiple identities we have and the multiple groups we are part of the multiple cultures and i think that's that's why i was drawn to to study migration and especially migration representation in museums I, it was a very personal uh, answer, but I think it's interesting as I'd say why we decided to 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 study this and to study those thematics. Thank you for sharing also your personal experience that of course matters a lot into this uh, discussion that is um, opening up various interesting things and topics. So uh, now, Violetta. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, hey, Obey, I have a question to you as well. Um, I'm talking about the Museum of Migration. I'm interested how the two, is the museum the NGO or did the museum develop from the NGO or how are the two connected to each other? I'm very interested to hear a bit more about that. Thank you. Um, so the museum, well, at the beginning there was the ONG, the ONG on NGO that was developed in the uh, 1969 that actually helped with the uh, with the um, with, with with the migrant issues regarding the administration and during this time this uh, this NGO decided to uh, reach or develop its project by building the Museum of Migration and this is actually the relation of both and. This is sometimes where I also wonder, because this is a lot of experience and they try to build upon, like to uh, develop the Museum of Migration, which makes them uh, like as a part of their, of the project or of their activities as an NGO. So they continue to do all the work they did before the museum was um, developed but they're using the museum as a tool, so to say, to reach out further and give the people, say, a louder voice or something like that? It's a different platform for sure. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Now we have uh, Natalia. So hello, good morning. I want to thank you for the presentation. It was awesome. Um, I hope I could be clear with my English. I'm just trying. <laughs> um, uh, I want to thank you especially for Gabriela because I'm a long time admirer of your the work uh, um, done by you all in the institution. Um, and I want to ask you, please, if you could comment quickly um, about how these activities uh, took place in the museum's program. If it was a process that is starting with um, common, if it, this movement come from the common consensus of uh, in your team, or how was the um, the process of convincing the other ones in the team about the need of to include this kind of activities? Um, if you could comment, please, about this. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, well, it's a um, it's a long story because I worked there for 19 years now. <laughs> it's really a long, long time. Um, but I think for the educational team, it's a consensus always. We are very excited when we have these sometimes crazy ideas and working in diversifying our work. We are very excited doing this. 
and reaching more and more diverse audiences, of course. That doesn't mean it's always con uh, consensual as in the museum as a whole. <laughs> and probably that's what you're asking. Uh, sometimes we, I think, I mean, it's as it is a 19 years old work and project and po uh, pedagogical project, I think there's somehow now it's really settled in the institution and somehow somehow I think we we settle and ex and I don't like the word example because it seems like we are a model and we are not a model we're struggling with our uh, situation like any other institution but somehow it, it sets um, a case like it's a case it's a case study of a long term a pro a, a pedagogical educational project in a Brazilian cultural institution and I think it's really important for other institutions also when they work want to work with dis disadvantaged, disadvantaged groups and they say look the Pinacoteca is doing this for almost 20 years so it really it's I, I, I with no fake modesty and this I think somehow the long-term uh, existence of our project is really important in the educational education museum education scenario in the country right now especially right now when muse, museum education is so, so fragile because of all the pan pandemic and all the situation that we can receive the publics etc but um, sometimes we have to convince some members of the the institution not convinced but uh, we have to argue with them to explain why it is important for us to develop this kind of work because it's really it's not the what is the social role of museums inside of the same institution is not consensual I think I, I would say different professionals in different institutions have different points of view of what is the uh, the social role of an, one institution so it's always uh, a continuous dialogue we have to 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 face and develop and undertake with our colleagues from inside of the museum and outside. Of course, it's very important for you to, if you want to have this kind of uh, projects that you have um, support from your managers, from your museum managers, directors. <clears throat> I wouldn't say this is the the world we would love. It's not the idea, but the real situation. If you don't have support from the museum director or managers or the the the, the these in, these instances of the, the superior instances of the institutions, unfortunately, you cannot uh, under, develop this kind of work. But after you you're doing this for almost 20 years. It's more difficult for, um, let's say, a museum director. I'm not saying it's the case right now in my institution, but it's more hard for a, a director to change it or to um, stop doing it, you know, because it's, it has some some roots already in the institution and also in the museum environment outside of the institution uh, as well. Anna? Hi, uh, everybody. Thank you so much again for organizing those uh, webinars. Um, uh, and I just I have two questions for um, Hove and uh, um, Andrea. Uh, but first, I wanted to say uh, to Gabriela that I'm a complete wow about uh, this idea to organize uh, training for frontline staff, as I am myself a frontline staff. Um, and with my background in museology, I saw many things that don't seem right. Um, and so I, I was really like when I was hearing your project, I thought about um, um, a book that I'm I'm reading right now. And um, uh, the director of the museum, uh, Museo de Arte Moderno uh, in Buenos Aires uh, was like, I just wanted to show the book just for people if they want to find it. Uh, it's um, the future of the museum. It's mostly about Museum of Arts. Uh, uh, it was uh, written and edited by Andras Santo, which is um, we, he's a Hungarian uh, um, art critics and writer. Um, and so um, there's a, a passage when when he said uh, when when the the director uh, of the Museo de Arte said that uh, 
we are not like an institution apart from our audience. We are our audiences ourselves. So I think there is a really um, like big work to like change the way we are uh, creating the exhibits to not only in museums of uh, immigration, but um, yeah, in, in the programs. And I, I totally saw what she was saying in, in your work. So I just wanted to show you that book just uh, uh, for you to be even, you know, uh, continuing your, your great work. Uh, but for uh, the two other questions, uh, so first we're talking about language. So um, how, uh, Obe and Andrea, how the, the 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 museums you you presented how they are like challenging uh they are like going through this challenge of like the language barriers uh um because um we have this example here I, i'm based in a, in the north america and in my city we have a lot of like uh, communities from uh dominican republic and etc but there is no not no museums were actually having Spanish language uh, in their exhibits. And now the museum where I'm working, they are starting to do that. And you see a, a real change coming. So how, what, what they are doing, because they have so many communities in Brussels, for example. So just wanted to hear about this. It's a big question, sorry. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting as well, I find. So um, Brussels, Brussels is already has um, like three or two national uh, languages, which is French and Dutch. And then, you know, also on top of that is English. So you mentioned putting that and another language in the museum. I think it will be a very long text. But this is something that the museum is trying to be aware of, is to try to provide accessibility to everyone. And this is where many, where the museum would uh, incorporate more uh, objects and uh, multimedia support in order to give the idea. But this is something that I agree that I find still for other communities, it's still difficult to, to understand. But this is something that after my meeting with the director, she has that in mind. And this is why they try to make the text as short as possible. Um, and I'm not sure if I continue with, uh, unless Andra, you have uh, <laughs> something to add. Yes, yeah, so during my, my PhD, like what I saw is that as I studied mainly three traditional museums, um, like Ellis Island in New York, uh, unfortunately, there's not really much more of the language uh, included. It's, more, it's the, the most like a traditional one, so it's, everything is pretty much in English. But you do have the um, the phone, the um, I forgot the audio guides in different languages, so that helps. Uh, in France, so recently they now they have translations into English and Spanish, so it's good. They are thinking of being more inclusive towards language, and the museum in São Paulo would be Portuguese and English as well. So, and from, from the museums I've been visiting, they try to include um, some type of translation, but uh, but it's certainly something that they're still working on and it could be maybe interesting to check uh, out closely how on the when they're dealing with the different communities on the community projects uh, with the different migrant communities how they would deal with uh, different languages i'm thinking in sao paulo with the communities coming from uh, french-speaking countries in africa for example if they would have any uh, programs uh, in French with those communities. It's something I, I in my thesis, as it was a choice, I had to choose and focus on one thing. I, I focused on the uh, permanent exhibitions, and I didn't check closely the the programs with the communities. But uh, I, I agree with you. It's something very, very important to have the language uh, taken into account. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and last, uh, so the second question, it was more about like one of particular subject that uh, immigration museums. Um, so I was like thinking, um, 
So I know that most of the immigration is social, but are how do the museums now are like uh, addressing this new, um, how, how do you say like this new reason why people are immigrating? Like, and um, I want to say environments. Um, so are they like how they are like addressing this subject? I'm just having that question. <laughs> Sorry, it's a difficult one. <laughs> can I obey? Do you want to go first? Or? Thank you. Oh, you can go first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what I, what I think is that um, it's in interesting to see that uh, many emigration museums that would be speaking of more like um, historical movements of migration Especially uh, leaving Europe and going to um, to the New World or to uh, countries outside of Europe. I'm, I'm thinking of the Red Star Museum. I'm thinking uh, of the Bremenhaven Museum in Germany. So there are ports, ports where like the people were leaving. And it's interesting to see that since 2012, uh, they started including also the contemporary immigration movements, so who's going to come into Europe with different groups that are installing themselves. And I think those museums can be very interesting to visit because at one point you have the emigration movement and a histor more historical and older history told there and the contemporary one. And they, they, of course, they try to show, you know, the different nationalities that are coming, that are being integrated, and I put in between brackets, but are being integrated. Uh, in the in the cities where those museums are uh, installed, but at the same time, it's still something in progress. I feel. I feel you know they give mainly the reasons. It could be work. It could be family. It could be uh, environmental disasters. It could be also war and conflict. But I think it's something they they're still working on. And it came I think to my mind as well another example: the museum in Barcelona. Uh, it's the same thing. They started talking about migration, the movement of migration inside of Spain, and especially in Barcelona. And since 2012, they also have a small part dedicated to the contemporary movements of migration to uh, Spain, and especially, of course, to Barcelona, as it's, it is um, a community managed museum, the community of San Andre. I, I can't remember especially the name, but it's a very interesting. I think the, the example in Germany, uh, Anvers, uh, that we spoke of, and the, the example in Barcelona are very interesting to think of how these museums are trying to present contemporary migration compared to the old migration movement. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very important, and especially because it just doesn't, like, like it's just not only the movement, it's just going to be like our future too. So I, I do think that that's, there's really an emergency to like just to talk about those um, movements with our environment with like the temperatures going more up. And then here, for example, we had like a, such an incredible number of tornadoes. So it's just it, it's really scary. And so I, I appreciate you giving me a couple of examples, even if they are very rare. Um, and good luck for your search, uh, you too. And <laughs> maybe Obe wants to add, and then I see Manuelina with the. Uh, I, I I actually agree with Andrea. There's not a lot to add other than the fact that you know there's migration, which is which is a regional localization, and then there's the immigration, which is a complete localization from somewhere far. Out. Further, and this is why, to me, immigration and migration is like very large subject. And it's yeah, I find it very interesting that we try to um, talk about all the aspects, even though to know that the Museum of Migration in Brussels is quite a small museum, and they try to focus or canalize their expertise, channel their expertise on a form of migration. This is what they put like uh, more in front and they highlight the migration for um, war because of war and 
But yeah, this is when the museum actually, this is like certain choices that the museum can, of course, try to develop on and work on. Manuelina? I don't know if there are others. Uh, I can pass my, my, my time to the others. I'd like to invite the students in museology to, to not be shy and put their questions. Uh, Gabriela doesn't know, but they already had an intervention in their course with Mila Kiovato. Ah, I know, I know that. Oh, she yes. told me, she told me, yeah. Yeah, so they are more familiar with Pinacoteca because I also present some pictures of the exhibition, some of works I admire, <laughs> but if they don't uh, start, I, I can make more one question, but I, I really don't want to monopolize. <laughs> I would like to, to share more with others. So, Gabriela, um, uh, we were talking before start today about the political situation in Brazil, that, uh, which is very bad, and uh, in several uh, countries is like this. Uh, some days before I was in a discussion about the museum definition, I was seeing, in fact, something organized by the ECOM Poland, I think, and someone of, uh, I don't know if Serbia or Hungary, I don't know, but uh, he was talking about how the museums were facing problems with the government there that is more or less like the government in Brazil, very far right. Uh, and, and the museums are resisting. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to know how how is uh, the impact of, of this in, in, in your in our work, the direct impact of, uh, because I know also Pinacoteca is responsible by the uh, Resistance Museum, which the topic is the dictatorship in Brazil and the government now is completely uh, negacionist. I don't know the name in English, but uh, I think you understand. They, they, the government denied that we had uh, dictatorship in Brazil. And uh, I, I, I would like you you talk a little bit how how is to continue this project that you have for 20 years already in, in this situation, how is now in, in Brazil? Well, um, the situation is really, really bad. I, I think it's a, it's a matter of surviving in every way, in professionally, physically, existentially it's like it's a really the, the struggle now it's for survival really and not metaphorically really literally um the thing is we are managed by the state government the local government and we have the luck i will say in these terms we have the luck that the the, the actual the current governor is an enemy of the president so <laughs> somehow he tries to uh, be a counterpoint or counterpart of the, the president, which is good for us in a sense. But what happens now is that they're not, they, they close the Ministry of Culture when the, the president uh, took the power. Um, but what they're doing is they're not closing the institutions like openly. What they're doing is like um, suffocating the institutions, not allowing them to have the budget for, to continue working. So for you to have an example, this is a new, very recent new from last week. I don't know if you're aware of that, Manuelina, yet, but we really need fed, federal um, uh, budget from, it's not direct budget, but the, the companies finance us through a legal uh, way when they give money their money that would go for tax for the government they can uh, provide this 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 tax money for cultural projects but then as we started the new restrictions for the, the pandemic the central government the federal government said no uh, project that's in, in a city that's currently with restrictions due to the pandemic will receive this money so this is like uh, blackmailing, they're blackmailing the cities doing this, or the cultural institutions. It's not our 
our um, opinion to close the museum, although I think it's the right thing to do, but the, it's a government, uh, the, gover the governor said we have to close, but then we cannot receive the federal budget because they said they won't give the money for the, the cities that are closed. So it's really perverse in a very, very mean way of doing things. So they're not saying we are closing your museum, but we are not giving you any money anymore. So it's it's really a, a very um, cynical way of doing things. As only to contextualize to, to the ones that are not following the news from there and didn't see our, didn't heard our talk in, in the beginning, before I start officially our webinar, we were talking that the central government of Brazil is against lockdown, against protect, protection of lives. And then each governor of each province, uh, state yeah. of Brazil takes different uh, attitudes. Then the federal government uh, is in conflict with these local governments and making this kind of pressure, uh, cutting budgets and obligate them to, to pay things that in fact are obligation of the federal government. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you. And are there other questions? Because oh, now, actually, I do, do. Do we have time for one another question? Yes, yeah? of course. So I would like to uh, ask Obey and Andrea, because I I um, I heard a, a little bit about the process of renewing the exhibition of the Immigration Museum in São Paulo, and it was really interesting because. Uh, they uh, have now this current approach of more an anthropological point of view about migration as a, like a human phenomenon that happened every time. It's not something new or recent. And they had a lot of problems with some immigrant communities because they, they felt they were left apart of this narrative. And it's really like when we talk about immigrant communities, we have some tensions among them too. So we had problems with more tradition, traditional and European immigrant communities. They wanted their story told, like the Italian commu immigrant community or the, I mean, mostly European uh, immigrant communities that immigrate in the late 19th century and during the first half of the 20th century. They felt like the museum belonged to them and they, they didn't feel comfortable of having other immigrant stories told at the museums and I would like to hear you a little bit about this kind of uh, tensions and negotiations um, uh, with different immigrant communities. As we know, they are very heterogeneous, they're not homogenic. Obey, you want to go first or I go? Uh, you can go first, if you don't mind. Okay, don't worry. So, Gabriela, thank you for your question. That's very good, actually, because uh, when I was uh, doing the interviews with the staff of the museum in Sao Paulo, they, they, they talked to me about this, this situation, and especially the first part of the exhibition, the human diasporas. Um, because yes, it was, it was very criticized, and there, 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 there is a lot of critics not only to the approach, this approach of the Brazilian museum, but other museums that do naturalize in a certain way migration as a human phenomenon, because we can go into biology, maybe by all, um, the biological views of anthropology, maybe we can, we're in a thin line, we have to be careful. But I think that at the same time, uh, it is a way to try to show that movement uh, the, the movement of populations is quite uh, normal <laughs> but it's quite current in the, in the history of humanity but of course it's a problematic uh, approach um, in many ways and uh, regarding the communities what I've been uh, what, I, what I noticed is that um, like for example the, the French Museum it was since the the scientific program of the museum, so before the museum opening, they wanted to create a base of uh, research and of exchange with the different communities, what they called the réseau. And it was, 
interesting the implementation. I had the chance to talk to uh, the person in charge of this in 2000, I think 2017, 18, uh, for, during an interview. And what he said, it was easier with some communities, of course, and more difficult with others. And with the Brazilian experience, what I feel is that uh, sometimes, even if the museum staff and the museum is trying to create this dialogue and this exchange, um, there is pressures and, and views from different communities. And sometimes, yes, it's very complicated to undo those entanglements and, and conflicts and tensions. And, and so, I, like, uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't, I, as I said, I didn't work more closely on the different projects. That would be something interesting for maybe my postdoctoral research <laughs> uh, to to look closer on this. But um, but I think that it's very difficult. What I feel is that it's very difficult to represent in in an exhibition all the different uh, communities and points of view. So of course there will always someone who feel maybe more represented than the other one, and it it will have lobbies inside. And and I think. Um, that's something, unfortunately, that's part of the game because the the representation of such a um, a multiple and so with with so many cultures and different um, aspects is very different to represent to represent into a just one exhibition. That's why during my uh, uh, PhD and um, this is uh, the France Viva, I think in English we say Viva, the Viva. It, it was something. Uh, we discussed it was the idea of maybe the ideal for migration museums would be to instead of having permanent exhibitions uh, have maybe different temporary exhibitions and that's something that I was discussing with the Bay recently as well uh, the migration museum in London it was uh, something they decided upon not to have a permanent exhibition they wanted to have many temporary exhibitions so they would be able to deal with different thematics uh, and and maybe be more open to different dialogues and different uh, multivocalities, let's say, into their exhibitions. Because it's very, it's quite hard to have a permanent exhibition that will stay for years, for 10, 12, 15. Like Ellis Island, they didn't change their exhibition since 1990. The only change they had was in 2015 when they opened the new wing dedicated to migration from 1965 to 2015. So when you when you think of permanent exhibitions that goes like through decades, of course I think there won't be a, a proper representation or, or or dialogue. Sorry, I spoke a little bit too much, but okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I actually completely agree with you, and I think this is part of the problem. Of course, that sometimes, especially when a participatory museum would be involved, it's who how to engage these communities and which community would actually have more of a say and more of a help in the process of creation and the participation of the collection. And yeah, I actually agree. And this is, it's, it's still something that I'm not actually very familiar with, apart from the fact that, well, in the museum here, for example, it's the collection get renewed from six to eight months to try to be as multivocal as possible. And it, and I think this is where it can be good. Yeah, that's all I know about the subject. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you all. So we are running a bit late, so we have to close, unfortunately, although the conversation was very interesting, but we will have other opportunities. I'm um, stopping the recording now, saying goodbye to everybody. And uh, if 